I got involved uh, with the uh, with research and practice on couples on the brink of divorce uh, about five years ago, uh, when uh, a judge, Bruce Peterson, uh, he became the new chief judge of the Hennepin County Family Court, which is Minneapolis and environment, uh, called me and said uh, he wanted to talk about some things he was seeing in meeting with couples in the divorce process. Uh, he wanted to know if there was any research on it and anything we could do. <clears throat> so when we had coffee, he told me that that the courts of this very progressive family court was uh, set up to provide all kinds of services to, to, to couples, a financial and a child rearing help, uh, all kinds of things, try to minimize uh, negativity and conflict in the divorce process. But there was nothing for a particular kind of couple that he was seeing um, when he would meet with them outside of chambers, um, where they seemed to be uh, cooperating so effectively in the divorce process and were showing uh, appreciation for each other um, that he wondered why some of them were getting divorced. He thought that. Uh, to do divorce this well <clears throat> required levels of respect and cooperation and appreciation that uh, he said was uh, quite a job. In fact, he said with you know, a thousand plus decisions that these couples have to make, uh, he would wonder if his wife and he who have a good marriage would be up to a divorce uh, because it, it takes so much uh, work. <clears throat> um, so he asked me an interesting question. He, he said, is there any information available on the reconciliation interest of couples who have entered the divorce process? Uh, and I said I wasn't aware of any, and I looked at the literature and, uh, um, and didn't find any. Um, there was some general demographic uh, uh, research about people who file for divorce and don't uh, end up divorced and so on. But, um, what I realized was that the, uh, most of the research about uh, divorcing people and divorcing couples uh, takes place after the divorce. So some of the classic studies asking about reasons for divorce uh, and the process of divorce are done with people who are well past it and who have uh, kind of formulated a story, if you will. But that's very hard to get, <clears throat> actually it's very hard to get access to people right in the process itself. Uh, and uh, that nobody had asked people about um, whether they thought their marriage could still make it. So <clears throat> we set up a research project uh, with the family court and I discovered that people um, uh, uh, were taking then a mandatory parent education class and at the end of the class they filled out an evaluation of the class uh, and uh, I thought that evaluation was actually a lot longer than it needed to be, almost everybody's happy with the class and so we shortened that and then had a one-page um, survey um, that asked some background questions, asked about reasons for the divorce, and asked two key questions that had not been asked before in the literature. Uh, one was, uh, even now, do you think your marriage could be saved if uh, one or both of you worked hard to make that happen? Uh, and the second one was, um, if the court were to make it available, uh, how likely would you be uh, to take advantage of a reconciliation service. Um, and so uh, we began to gather data um, uh, and what we found uh, over a period of time was that um, 25 to 30 percent of the people, these are individuals now, in the divorce process um, indicated that they thought their marriage could still be saved, at least they answered maybe or yes to that question, uh, and uh, maybe or yes to the question of how likely they would be to take advantage of a reconciliation service. Um, and so this was the first wave of our data. Uh, we, I knew it wasn't going to be zero, uh, but I had no idea what percentages we would, we would come up with. When we were able to match them as couples, uh, we found that uh, about 10 percent of couples, both separately, thought their marriage could still be saved with work and were uh, open to a reconciliation service. And then in another 30 percent of the couples, one thought that it could be saved and was open to reconciliation, the other was not. So that was, you know, 40 percent of the couples, at least one person thought uh, something could come out of this that, that for the marriage, and in 10 percent both did. 
So um, we presented this uh, data uh, to a group of, uh, of collaborative divorce lawyers, and these are people who are committed to a healing process. And uh, they were stunned by it because these were their clients, um, and they really weren't effectively even asking people these questions. So out of that came um, a project that I started with a group of collaborative divorce lawyers that we called the Marital Reconciliation Option Project. Uh, in family law. And what we did over a period of many months was uh, work out a protocol uh, for um, divorce lawyers to open up a conversation about whether divorce was the, the, the path that their client really wanted to pursue. Uh, one of the views of, I have of divorce is that it's a solution to a problem that people don't think they can solve in any other way. I don't know anybody gets married with the expectation that, that they want to get a divorce, um, but they reach a point where they don't see any way to live uh, a good life and to be married. Um, uh, and that the divorce lawyers were afraid uh, that if they opened this up, uh, that this reconciliation conversation, that their clients would, would be thinking, well, you don't think I should get divorced, so you're not going to really represent me well. Uh, and what I realized was that that's that's sort of the fear that uh, the physicians I worked with for many years were afraid that they asked about somebody's personal stress or how their family is doing, um, that that patient might think, gee, the, the doc isn't taking my organic pain seriously, they think it's all in my head. Where the reality is when, when physicians are uh, skilled at that and confident at that part of the conversation, patients don't get upset. So I figure it's the same way with the lawyers, that if the lawyers felt confident and, and uh, had, a, had a basic protocol to engage that conversation, their patients would be fine with it. So what we developed was um, a very simple um, intake uh, uh, form with, with a, with a four-part scale um, that goes this way. Um, as your lawyer, I'm interested in your feelings and attitudes about uh, the divorce as well as the legal aspects of it. And, um, and here are four attitudes that people uh, have towards their divorce, could you uh, check which one is closest to your own attitude at this point? The first one is, uh, I'm done with this marriage, nothing would make me change my mind. The second is, I have mixed feelings about the divorce, sometimes I think it's a good idea and sometimes I'm not so sure. The third is, I would consider reconciling if my spouse made major changes. And the fourth is, I don't want this divorce and I would work hard to prevent it. So what the lawyers then would do is to have people fill this out along with their name and address and so on in the waiting room. Their legal assistant brings them the form and the, and the lawyer can simply look to see what they check. And then at an appropriate time in the interview, could say, uh, Mrs. Jones, I see you check that you have mixed feelings about the divorce, could you tell me? Or I see you check that, that you're done with this marriage, could, could you tell me more about that? And, um, and then a series of follow-up questions uh, and observations that, that they can make. For instance, when somebody is getting a divorce because they're in love with somebody else and they're determined to marry that person, they think it's all going to work out great, and you know they had a pretty good marriage but they're deeply in love, uh, there's some things that, that wise attorneys uh, can say in that situation. Um, and um, so, so we worked that out, and then the lawyers then are now having confident conversations with people, and there was a subset of their clients um, who uh, were open to uh, some alternative uh, to just going ahead with the divorce. And then the question was, well, what alternative? Because a lot of their clients had had marriage counseling. In our research, we found that about 45% of people had had conjoint marital counseling or therapy. But usually only uh, the average was just four or five sessions. So, and it, it didn't, didn't succeed. Um, in the minds of many of, the, of, of these clients. <clears throat> and the lawyers also didn't want to be conveying the idea that, okay, so you should go back into marriage counseling to fix your problems, because what they were dealing with were people who were saying, you know, I'm not completely sure uh, which direction I want to go in. So I told them about a, a clinical procedure that I had uh, worked out some years ago. In fact, I had learned the elements of it from a famous feminist family therapist named Betty Carter. And I had done this in my own practice, um, in which you don't start the therapy yet. You, you have this phase of work in which you help them sort out which way they want to go. 
um, in which often when uh, somebody wants to save the marriage, you help them bring their best self forward there and not make things worse. And for the other one, you give them space to, to look at, uh, at, the, at the marriage and decide whether they want to try to save it. So it's sort of like a pre-therapy. So I told them about this, and they said, that's what we want to send people to. Um, not marital counseling that, to solve the problems, but a place, where, a holding environment where they can take a look at uh, whether they want to try. And they said, well, what's that called? And I said, I don't have a name for it. I just sort of did it. Uh, and so we, we came up with a name. The name we came up with is Discernment Counseling. Discernment Counseling for couples on the brink of divorce. Uh, and so uh, I said, okay, uh, this is short-term work. Uh, why don't you start sending people to me and I'll work out a protocol for this, uh, really with a name, um, not just something I've done kind of informally, but I'll work out a protocol. And so that's really launched then from the research to the work with the lawyers to now a, a form of clinical practice um, uh, that we call discernment counseling and, and developed, so the name for it, discernment counseling, and then who's it for? So I developed a name for it, the mixed agenda couple, and that is this uh, the very common situation, and the research certainly supports this, where somebody is leaning out of the marriage, they're seriously considering divorce, and the other person wants to save it. They think this is a bad idea to divorce. So mixed agenda couple, um, and a, a pretty good uh, number of people who present to marriage counseling uh, have that. Uh, my estimate based on one study and as, uh, interviewing therapists is that about 30% of couples who go to conventional marital therapy are mixed agenda couples. It may be somewhat higher or lower, but it's, it's a reasonable chunk. And the research suggests that people are hardly ever at the same place at the same time when it comes to divorce. Somebody's usually out of head. So what we developed then was a protocol for discernment counseling for mixed agenda couples on the brink of divorce. Uh, and I then um, leveraged this research uh, this work with the lawyers with this new form of clinical practice to approach the legislature uh, with a key, a key legislator who I had worked on before um, uh, and we, we uh, decided that we, what we wanted to do was create a center uh, center of excellence in working with couples on the brink of divorce we called the Minnesota Couples on the Brink Project with a mission to develop the capacity uh, of, of, of clergy, therapists, lawyers, uh, and others uh, in the state to work with couples constructively where they are not certain whether they want to divorce or try to work on their marriage. Um, and, um, and so we now had a, a, a kind of an infrastructure of lawyers and I started to train some other therapists. And then the funding procedure, the funding uh, mechanism, um, is a $5 surcharge on marriage license fees. Uh, that would go to the center at the, the Minnesota Couples on the Brink Project at the university. And we got that through the legislature um, uh, with no dissenting votes. Um, and uh, so we now have uh, some income, steady stream of income that doesn't have to be renewed each year. Um, and we sold it on the basis of an insurance policy that, you know, 40, 50 percent of the couples coming into this, uh, getting married each year, uh, are going to be looking at possible divorce sometime down the line. And this develops the capacity of uh, professionals and others in the state of Minnesota to respond to them constructively when they are at that point. Um, and so uh, we now have a center. Uh, Steve Harris, uh, who is the MFT director here uh, at the, uh, in our department, is the associate director. Bridget Manley Mayer is the coordinator. And we have begun to train uh, therapists. Uh, we also have a clergy group who I've worked with to develop a, a pastoral discernment counseling approach, um, continue work with lawyers. Uh, and we are uh, at a point now where we are doing uh, further, we're doing evaluation research, we're doing further survey research. We're analyzing what we're doing, and at, at the point when we're ready, we're going to be going more national with this around the, the training of discernment counseling. So those are some of the things that came out of a simple phone call from a local family court judge.